Hello everyone, I'm Rabbi Chaitovsky here in my office at BMHBJ. Welcome to another uh, video dvar. Uh, we've had an exciting run of uh, Torah portions. We had the Torah portion of Yitro, which we got the Torah, and the Torah portion of Mishpatim this past week, where the Torah is explained, or at least the beginning of the explanation of the Torah, how to put it into practice, uh, is, is laid out before us. And then we seem to digress a little bit, and the rest of the book of Shemot is actually taken up with details concerning the building of the Mishkan, uh, the portable sanctuary, the home, as it were, uh, of God's presence. The word Mishkan and the word Shechina are, are closely related, and they both come from the word Shachain, neighbor, um, and that indicates that the relationship that we're trying to have uh, with God uh, is supposed to be a, uh, I wouldn't say a neighborly one in the uber familiar sense of the word, but neighborly in that God's presence is right there. And the Mishkan represents uh, the indwelling uh, of God's presence. It's God's address. And uh, there's great debate as to the order of these parshiot, and, and it's a technical question. We discussed some of that last year. I won't get into that again, but coming on the heels of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai and the beginning of the explaining of the Torah in Mishpatim, it seems clear that one of the purposes of the Mishkan is to intensify and to maintain uh, the experience of the Israelites at Sinai, where God was so close and God was so imminent um, that the Jewish people uh, needed to have something that would continue that, and the Mishkan uh, would be the location, God's address, a mini Mount Sinai, even as they started to travel uh, through their uh, wanderings and meanderings uh, in the desert. Um, we all know that they were camped out for a little while at the foot of Mount Sinai, and certain things happened, the golden calf, for example, which led to a perhaps a new meaning for the Mishkan. Uh, but whatever the case may be, the relationship between the Mishkan and the giving of the Torah seems to be uh, clear, at least by the order of the Torah portions as they, as they are. Within the Mishkan, uh, there are a number of, uh, number of items uh, that Moshe is told uh, to design and build. And among them uh, are uh, the Ark, the Aron Kodesh, that housed the Luchot, the Ten Commandments, ultimately the broken Ten Commandments, as well as the, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the second set. Uh, there was a Mizbeach, uh, there was an altar, uh, and then there was also the Shulchan, uh, the table in which the uh, loaves of bread, the showbread, was placed. And of course, there was the very famous uh, Menorah, uh, the seven-branched candelabra that represented the, the, the light uh, that was supposed to emanate from the Mishkan to everywhere. And we have a Ner Tamid in our own synagogues, and that's probably reminiscent of the original eternal light uh, for, uh, that was in the Mishkan. Uh, the Torah tells us a, a very interesting fact about three of these four items. Three of them seem to be topped with a little fence, a little, a little, I don't know how to describe it, uh, a little parapet running around the perimeter of each of these items. The, the Hebrew word for this is a zer. And we can translate it as a fence or a parapet. It's some kind of crown at the top. And... Uh, three of the four items, as I said, have this. Uh, the menorah does not. And it might be interesting to explore just for a minute as to why that might be the case. Uh, why would the Aron Kodesh, why would the Mizbeach, and why would the Shulchan uh, all have the Zer, and, and, and why would the menorah not? And it's very interesting because in Pirkei Avot, in chapter 4, Mishnah 17, we're actually told that there are three crowns that exist in the world. Actually, there are four, but the Mishnah first lays out three, and one is the crown of Torah, and the other is the Keter Kehuna, the crown of 
priesthood. And the third one is the crown of malchut, the crown of, of royalty, of leadership. And then it says that there's a keter shem tov. There's also a, the crown of a good name, which we're told is ole al gabehen, which surpasses all of the others. It's even better than the crown of Torah, kuhuna, or uh, malchut. According to our chazal, our rabbis, each of the items that I mentioned, that are mentioned in this week's Torah portion, are connected to one of those crowns. The Aron clearly represents the crown of Torah. The Mizbeach clearly represents the crown of Kehuna. I guess by default then, the Shulchan represents the crown of Malchut. And those are the three things that had the Zer at the top. And the Zer is like a boundary. The Zer reminds us that when it comes to Torah, when it comes to Kehuna, and when it comes to Malchut, there are certain lines that cannot be crossed. The Torah is all about setting boundaries. Leadership means setting boundaries. And as a priest, of course, the priest that has a boundary of super holiness that cannot be crossed, we know all of that. And perhaps there's an instinctive and understood symbolism in the crown, in that little, in the parapet that is at the top of each of those things to remind us that first and foremost is the concept of boundaries. And Judaism is nothing if not a boundaried kind of existence. And some people perhaps take that a little bit too far, but we understand that there are boundaries. The four amot of halacha are boundaries, and we cannot cross them without falling over the edge and venturing outside the pale, so to speak. But then it becomes interesting as to why the menorah does not have the little zer at the top. Why is it unboundaried? And the menorah, I guess, thinking out loud, might represent the keter shem tov, the crown of a good name. The menorah represents the good name. What is it about the menorah? What is it about the good name that doesn't need the crown, that doesn't need the, the zer, the parapet, the boundary? And I always look at uh, these, uh, these things as almost a dichotomy between our relationship to God and our relationship to other people. We, first and foremost, develop our good name through our relationships with other people. And sometimes, in building relationships with other people, we can't always be as mindful of the boundaries that normally are associated with Torah. For example, if I'm only going to hobnob and be friends with people who are super religious like me, or who observe Judaism like me, or who keep the kosher home like me, well, my number of friends may be minimized. If I want to develop relationships that transcend boundaries, sometimes I have to be a little adventurous. And that adventurous spirit is perfectly okay, is welcomed within the bounds of Judaism. The fact is, in order for me to share Judaism, I have to do it with people who may not be as clued in and who may not be doing things the way that I do. And I think the idea of the menorah showing its light, sharing its light with all who wish to come in contact with it is key here. Our Torah is initially very personal. Kehuna, priesthood, very, very personal. Leadership, very, very personal. Royalty, the king, it's almost another world. But the crown of a good name is only achieved by interacting with other people who may not be part of Torah, who may not be part of Kehuna, who may not be part of royalty or leadership. But that's okay. I can break down some of those boundaries in my desire to be as embracing as possible. So the Mishkan, the indwelling of God's presence, the address of God, has within it boundaries 
a reminder about the importance of boundaries, but it also has in it a, a encouragement to break through some of those boundaries sometimes and to reach out to others and to try to bring them in to the embrace of Torah. That's really what the Mishkan is about. Recognizing our boundaries, reaching beyond them to bring other people in. And that is a very important message for this Shabbat, Shabbat Parshat Terumah. We hope to see you in Shul. Shabbat Shalom.